it has happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the unwokening is here. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the show formerly known as Midnight Mormons. Now it's Midnight Strike Through Mormons. I'm your host, Cardinalis, and today I'm joined in the studio by none other than Jacob Hansen. And it has happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the unwokening is here. And Brother Gareth Corbett has given literally, I don't know how else to call it other than a speech for the ages, a speech just as significant as Beware of Pride by our boy, I almost said Spencer W. Kimball, but I meant to say Ezra Taft Benson. Um, It is here, it is loud, it is proud, and we are gonna analyze every minute of the unwokening. Um, Before we jump in, what were your thoughts on this, 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 this talk, my friend? What were your thoughts? I, I was blown away. Like, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, this is exactly what needs to be said. And it was it was so good because it wasn't just like, oh, you know, like activism against the church is bad. It was very much like he also talked about the nuances of how activism actually has its place in certain settings and the way the doctrine of Christ plays into it. It's just it was great. Yeah. And and what I, I really felt is it wasn't like you're not allowed to criticize. But yeah, there is a difference between doubts and critiques and then you just wanting to destroy something. And honestly, he said the quiet part out loud that all of us knew. I have been dogging on these guys as not having a freaking spine. And he got a spine of steel and just balls of just pure titanium, <laughs> dude. You know what I'm saying? And he just straight up said it. And uh, we're OK. We're just going to watch it and and let the audience decide if it was as B.A. as I thought it was. Um you chose different clips than I did. Uh, I will say something before we play this, play this first clip. First off, you chose a horrible clip to start out with. He looks either constipated or angry. And, you know, all of the woke scolds and progmos that like to say, oh, the church is just run by old, angry white men. You know, he's got the old and the angry part down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're just, we're just going to dive right into what he says. Okay, but before we start, though, you chose a very interesting clip than I did. I thought it was great how he started out in the beginning and he actually called out a friend that was like a general or a corporal from the military buddy of his. Okay. And he he had some jab at him. He's like, yeah, dude, us guys, we jab at each other. And Uh and I I felt like he gets it. The dude gets it. You know what I'm saying? Like (laughs) he gets that dudes, we spar with each other. He could be on the bro show. So I I feel (laughs) like, uh, like our boy Garrett here is uh, he's a midnight Mormon. He's de facto midnight Mormon because he gets the sparring and the jabbing just for fun, right? So anyway, yeah. without any more ado, we don't want to bury the lead. We're actually going to jump right in and see what this guy said. Um, clip one, go. I speak of our enemy's effort to transform disciples of Jesus Christ into activists towards or against the Lord's church the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its leaders. It is a three-step maneuver that is genius in its simplicity and effectiveness. First, focus the rising generation and the valiant generally away from the doctrine of Christ and onto real or imagined unfairness or injustice in the Lord's Church and the imperfections of its leaders. Okay, we're just going to stop right there really fast. Sheer genius. First off, notice, okay, notice that this guy was kind of like smiling a little bit, you know, as he like put up the first one. Like, I swear in the back of his mind as he's like smiling, he's like, oh, it's going down. They're going to freak out. You know what I'm saying? That dude knew he had a bee suit on and he was clubbing and he was poking the hornet's nest, dude. He was just poking it. Like E.T. phone home. He was just poking it. And like he was smiling right as that was happening. I mean, look at this, bro. He's like looking into the back audience and he's like half smirking. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, this is going down. You know what I'm saying? And I loved how he said real or imagined. 
That was I was going to point that out because it, it, it's interesting that he brings up, look, it isn't that these issues are imagined unfair things. Some things are legitimately unfair. But yeah. as he goes on to talk about it, he, he gets into how these are used to create, you know, activism towards the church as the solution to them rather than the doctrine of Christ. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So we're going to we're going to keep going, man. Let's so see what as, else he's got to say. As we continue, are we going? Uh, yeah, just just roll it, actually. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, there's clipped. Oh, you have them conveniently divided into clips. Good job. Second, use this shift in focus to stir up feelings of disillusionment, annoyance, resentment, anger, and hatred toward church policies, declarations, proclamations, principles, doctrines, and eventually leaders. Okay, I'm just going to pause right there. Oh, oh, you were actually pausing right there, too. Oh, that's great. We were, like, right on the same page. You we're, we mean, were in man. sync when we came up with it. You know what I'm saying? Up with where to, where to put this, these clips together. Yeah, is, 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 as he's talking about it, you notice that motive matters. Okay? Like, motive really does matter. One of the very first things that psychologists and psychotherapists and family counselors will talk about is not assigning people dirty motives. So I really generally avoid that at all costs, unless I know for a fact that's what you're trying to do. And there's some people where I've just realized they really are just trying to destroy the church. They hate that it exists. You know, they hate their parents, hate their family, hate whatever. And, and they're just, you know, trying to burn it the F down, whether it's with truth or with gasoline and matches, that's all they want to do is burn it down. All right. And so, um, I like how he said the motives like uh, is what you're doing trying to yield an actual improvement because if you're trying to improve something you're not going to behave this way or are you just literally just trying to do damage because well, you're just trying to well, do damage you will behave that way so there there, the, there was a reflection first, on motive yeah definitely and and I you know he talks about two things here so he first talks about sort of this focus on unfairness which may even be really unfair but then it's about <clears throat> stirring up feelings of, this is the second part, feelings of annoyance, resentment, anger, you know, you know, kind of like. What are you trying to do? Yeah, you're trying to annoy and anger people or are you trying to build something? Yeah. And and the thing is, is it, so I what I've done is in some of these other clips, I've 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 pulled together some some examples i think that i've seen at least in the online world of people doing this of stirring up sort of feelings against the brethren in the church um because of the church's as he said doctrines <clears throat> proclamations i think i know what he's talking about when he yeah, says that okay and yeah. specifically this this next clip goes into stuff that uh that happened El elder holland um you know spoke to byu and said kind of you guys got to support the doctrine of the family and we have to you know we can't let our love turn into uh advocacy so maybe roll that next clip and let's take a look at what he said and maybe an example of what uh brother corbett was talking about okay so here we go it's condoning an advocacy so julie hanks the day after posts love oh, is advocacy i know we're, we're supposedly she agreed to come on our show in that portion so i think it was like the following day or oh it's our boy bridger advocacy is love i disagreed with what he said and here's here's what i i want to use this quote from that it's from the ensign um 2014 jesus christ is our advocate with the father the word advocate has latin roots meaning one who pleads for another the savior pleads for us using understanding just okay so first off i just have to say that two things just came to my mind right away. First off, it seems like she's kind of made up this excuse afterwards. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt that she's just being misunderstood. But second, she looks hot with those cheek injections. Like whoever's doing her hair and whoever's doing this, the the, the cheek injections is Have straight you seen up pictures on of her point. From like like ten years ago, she looks like a totally different person. You know what I'm saying? Well, I like she this. She actually version. is a case of plastic surgery that actually went well. Most yeah, it's like, do plastic surgery. Like I'm not a fan, but like whoever she's gone to, like they did a pretty good job actually. Dude, like Julie Hanks is like now the official Mormon hot 
mom behind like that Michelle Stone chick. Like she might just she might be bumping Michelle Stone out of the out of the way. You know what I'm saying? We we can't be dogging on her anymore, man. Not with those cheek and jack. Like she's got it all. She went tanning before Bridger's podcast. She done got her hair did. <laughs> like, rock on, man. Here's here's what's crazy though. Uh, okay. Listen to what she's saying. She says, I'm an advocate for people that suffer. But the thing is, and this was my point that I was going to bring up, an advocate against who? Uh, She's an advocate against the church. Uh, you bring up a really good point there, bro. You bring up a really good point. An advocate against who? You really, Yeah. When you set yourself up as, okay, I'm the activist that's trying to affect positive change because I just try and follow Christ, you're inherently saying that their estimation of what following Christ means, as in the church leaders, is wrong. And I am better than them. And they're not right until they're up to my esteemed activist level. And that actually makes me wiser, which is inherently more godly trait, which means I'm closer to God than they are. And the sin of pride is a, 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 a sin of comparison. And there's all kinds of arrogance and pride just drenched in that. So, um, yeah, that's a oh, tough one. We'll finish the and, clip. We'll finish okay. the clip. And I'll see if I can't uh, add this in justice and mercy, knowing this can fill us with love and gratitude for his atonement. So the meaning of advocate is one who pleads for another. That's what I do Against as the an advocate for people who are suffering. Okay. Well, that's also, I have to tell you, I'm sorry. The only reason why I kind of push back a little bit on that too, is I think there's a difference between advocating for suffering and bearing each other's burdens, which we are called to do. And that's what I said in the debate with RFM. Like I don't view people as condemned. I'm condemned, you know, and, and if you're gay, if you're mute, if you're deaf, if you're lame, if you're burdened by uh, a, a mental illness, by just the thoughts of inadequacy, if you, if you've got personal trials that, that the Lord in his infinite mercy spares no one from personal trials, you know what I'm saying? If you have any of these things, I will mourn with those who mourn and I will comfort those who stand in need of comfort as a Christian in my Christian calling. When you say love is advocacy, especially with the contemporary pride flag superimposed upon it, you're not saying I mourn with those who mourn. You're saying I support the political and secular agenda that is directed towards the church of the current LGBTQIAA plus plus lobby because I fundamentally because she doesn't believe homosexual behavior is sinful and if she's right I'd be on her team well I'm not going to say what she believes or doesn't believe but I'll say that that was a little bit of a shuck and jive that was watch, a little bit of a dodge watch my video it's perfectly clear that was a little bit of a two step here I don't feel comfortable <laughs> saying what people believe because again I I don't know if you can get in her head she can only hopefully be honest she, in stating you, you what she believes you can watch what she says and it's it's obvious like it's not okay I, That's, I, I by the way that. if you get her on the podcast you gotta ask her that question does okay. she believe homosexual behavior is sinful uh, I hear you. And the, but then you also have to wonder, OK, am I engaged in the colloquial definition of sinful, which is loaded with all kinds of uh, prejudgment in the layman's tongue? Or am I using the religious definition of sinful, which means needing and self-improvement? You know, so I, I, I if she's willing to clarify and say she's misunderstood, I'll believe her. If not, then, yeah, we got a problem, you know. So, OK, cool. Sick. Um, is there any left to this clip or no? Do yeah, keep go ahead going? and do it because just listen to what she talks about. About remember, who is she advocating not only for but against? Okay, let's hit it. Right, I have a ton of privilege, especially in. Oh, there's the progmo signal word. She did she's the going. dog whistle. She her, admitted well, her gonna privilege. Up, she's going to set up the I have privilege because I'm a white woman heterosexual in the church. And I'm respected, you forgot I'm cisgender a wife, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to use my privilege to advocate against the brethren for people who I believe are suffering because of our doctrine, specifically in this case, gay people. OK, interesting. So let's go back and we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll let her finish in her words. Give her the give her the benefit of the doubt. In Mormon culture and I try to use it to plead for people who do not have the platform that I have or the privilege that I have. So I, I'm totally comfortable with that. Okay. 
Okay. I, this is where I start just in my mind. I say like, eh, I mean, I call a little bit of BS because everybody after they get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, my son does this all the time. He'll be like, uh, I think my sister wanted a cookie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's like, am I really supposed to believe, bro, that at 2 a.m. when you got hand caught with your hand in the cookie jar, that you were doing just this massive act of benevolence because, you know, your sister needed a cookie who's asleep in the other room. Well, I, or I think she I think she genuinely the thing is, I'll, I'll put myself I, in her shoes. Dude, if John I, Deland, if I believe that homosexual behavior was totally legitimate and gay marriage was just as legitimate as, as heterosexual marriage in the eyes of God. I would be on her team. Okay, fine. At the same time, I'm just saying I admit my bias going in. I admit my bias. And maybe I am jaded from this whole blogger knackle thing. Okay. But I can't tell you how many of these... 99% of the people that I see posting this crap online, okay, are people that are virtue signaling to a secular progressive left that they think and have been convinced by the media are the cool kids and they want to be with the cool kids, but they can't quite, you know, can't quite settle their membership in the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints with what the cool kids say you got to do. And so they keep trying to change the church so the cool kids like it, not realizing the cool kids hate us and you can never do enough <laughs> before you realize I, I just that they'll never be satisfied. And so these people get angry that we won't budge and make it so that their cool friends like us while their parents, who they've deemed are uncool, are saying, look, let me tell you the truth about the cool kids. You know what I'm saying? And let me tell you the truth about what happens when you go out and you get sloshed on a Friday night and get in a car accident. All right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I'm 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 even a little bit more cynical than you, I guess, in this regard. When people are posting pride flag studded love is advocacy banners the day after Jeffrey R. Holland says, let's make sure that our love doesn't get corrupted and twisted and shamefully bent into advocacy, okay? Don't tell me that you are just making some fly-by-night comment about how you mourn with those who mourn. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's all I really meant. No, dude, I'm sorry. That's like literally showing up to the world club, uh, the the World Cup with a Venezuelan or Nicaraguan flag. You know what I'm saying? And then when all of your relatives from Cuba show up for the game, you're like, oh no, I no, I'm with you guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sorry, you don't get a virtue signal with that massive flag, and then say, I just man, I'm mourning with those who mourn. You know? So okay. It's, it's I, I, I think that was a little bit of BS, but uh, there's always room for somebody to reconsider their actions. And I think she's gotten a lot of celebrity that she may not have had previously in her life over all of these social issues that she's chosen to engage in. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in the semi-celebrity nature of being an Instagram person with a six-figure following. You might endorse ideas and beliefs whose logical logical conclusions you haven't considered yet. So I will give that person grace and the benefit of the doubt if she comes on my show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. So anyway. Here, um, hit 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 this one last clip. Just go through it. It's, it's one last clip. 30 seconds of clip. Okay. And and I want to. Clip three? Clip three. It's Yeah, it's the next clip. And okay. Because we didn't get to the second part of that. I want to I want to see it. All right, let's hit it. Third, manipulate these negative impulses to instigate the use of worldly or secular activism or advocacy rather than the doctrine of Christ to effect change in the kingdom of God. In the church. Ooh, okay. Oh, and your boy Bridger. You brought Listen your boy Bridger on. Listen okay. to what he says. He says, in the church, and let's continue. We can grow and we can change and we can see the, you know, see good things, see bad there things. Can be, there can be social pressure that's created. We're saying we all don't like this. And the hope is, is that that will sway the brethren. Do you think brethren can be bound by foolish traditions? Absolutely. Then what's the problem with bottom up um, ideas and hope for improvement? Because the, well, I'm well, there's nothing wrong. Let me just interrupt here. There's nothing wrong with bottom up ideas. And hope for improvement. In fact, the scriptures say you should pray with a hope-filled heart and that your faith might affect change. 
When my daughter was in the hospital, I prayed with a hope-filled heart, with a very bottom-up idea. Me as a f- child of God, holding his daughter, praying and supplicating to Father in heaven. I had a lot of top, uh, I mean, uh, bottom-up ideas that I was trying to uh, uh, to send God's way. And I think there was a lot of prayers that were said in a bottom-up fashion. God actually doesn't have a problem with bottom-up activism if done through prayer and supplication and the methodologies that he has already proven over 2,000 or 4,000 years work. Am I wrong? No, that's exactly right. It's it, To me, it's not about like, and this is the whole thing of his talk that I think was so brilliant. He said, look, he's taking your good impulses, but he's he's taking you outside of the appropriate channels where this is supposed to be directed, either, like you're saying, through prayer or with your priesthood leaders and that kind of stuff. But go, go on, watch what Bridger says. Okay. Hey, our boy Bridger, he just called me out the other day. So I got to get him on the show. We're going to see if we can get him on the show. But anyway, okay. This is what our boy Bridger said, and we'll let him finish in his own words. Not against it if it flows through the proper channels of priesthood authority. But if it's not moving through those channels, because it doesn't. Most it's times. not my kingdom. Well, also, it's not moving. Well, who are you to say it's not moving fast enough? Bingo. Like, are you the judge dog? You know that's, what I'm saying? Like, that's the thing. It's like, well, the, bre- the brethren aren't getting the revelation that I want. It's like, yeah. What, Dude, I prayed last Tuesday. Well, maybe, maybe I prayed maybe last Tuesday. Think it is. Like I literally prayed last Tuesday. What's going on, God? You know what I'm saying? Where my money at? Where my money at? You said I could pray over my farms and my fields and my flocks. I ain't a millionaire yet. Yo, yo, we got to unionize down here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like, okay. All right, should I uh, finish this one? Really fast? Yeah, that's about it. That, that's about it. He basically has this idea though, okay. that, hey, why don't we create social pressure and that will help the revelation to flow because otherwise like it's not flowing. And so it's up to us to pressure the brethren to get the the quote unquote right revelation. And the whole point of Elder Corbett's talk is like, that's not the way. All that does is it undermines faith in the leaders, it undermines the institution of the church, and it leads people to leave the church. And what happens when they leave the church? They don't come be, go out and be Catholics. They go and become atheists and they abandon Christ. And, and their so families and their sanity. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? And 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 so that's that is that is ultimately what I took away from his talk is that he shows how this all works. And then he explains that, yes, change is needed and change has happened. But the way we go about it is the key. See, I'm kind of through activism. I'm kind of disappointed here, man. So you're giving this very well reasoned response to saying, look, this isn't the way. And you're teaching people effectively through the doctrine of Christ what the correct way is that will be wholesome to the individual and also wholesome to the institution, as well as in tune with God and man. You're doing all of this holistic stuff. I was thinking we're going to come on here and dunk on a bunch of progmos because the unwokening has begun but instead i'm engaged in this nice spiritually wholesome conversation with a guy whose white balance finally looks good in his camera so you know it's like i i just i was hoping to holler and yell and dunk on some progmos it's ended up veering into this very nice and positive thing which i'm okay with because i don't want to have to take ulcer medication but you know we'll party on the next one We'll dunk on the progmos in the next one. <laughs> Corbett, what's up, my man? We're going to see what he's got to say right here. Boom shagalaka. Third, manipulate these negative impulses to instigate the use of worldly or secular activism or advocacy rather than the doctrine of Christ. I love that he said worldly or secular activism. How many times in this show have I actually told people, look, these people are not people trying to affect positive change. They are missionaries for secular progressivism into the church and they'll do it at any cost. They don't care about improving the church. They just want to literally evangelize secular progressivism into the church instead of trying to evangelize goodness and true fairness and equity uh, and, and, and Christian welfare into progressivism, you know what I'm saying? 
instead of we are all children of God equality into secular progressivism. They just want straight up socialist equity. You know, these people are missionaries of secularism into the church instead of missionaries of the church into secularism. And if you can't call a spade a spade, then words no longer have any meaning. And here he actually calls a spade a spade. In fact, instead of instead of saying it's a spade, he said it was exactly what it is, secular activism. To affect change in the kingdom of God. A big part of that is, again, it's the direction that it's pointed, right? Uh -huh. The direction is not from the church out to the world. It's the ideas of the world pointed at the church and activism. And, and that's why he, he labels this as activism towards the church rather than just activism, because there's a distinction there that's important. So I noticed also, by the way, that he came up with this really cool moniker, this acronym. Is, is it an acronym when it's the letters? I'm totally I think it's acronym with the letters. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. I'm totally forgetting my like seventh grade English here. Okay. <laughs> but um he came ATC. Like he didn't even do the boomer announce, we're gonna be calling this ponderize. You know, like he didn't even like come out and say, like, we're making up this new acronym acronym. Here's what I suggest, like a freaking like steely spirit bind boss he just says atc people are like what is that what is that what is that and they put it well, together and it's like boom I, I, he just birthed the acronym he just I love birthed that you it can just, now you can just drop that ac that acronym whenever you see it it's like oh so hey, look atc so we've just birthed a new acronym into the lexicon atc and so what is someone who's going to practice atc what are we going to call them my friend you now have the chance to birth like we, we call them inactives when they stop coming to church the Exmo anti Mormons have been asked to be called Exmos. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. um, and then there's there's TBMs. There's like all of these other acronyms we got that some catch on, some don't. What's the ATCers going to be called? Are we literally just going to call them ATCers or AT actors? AT ers? Ah man, you know? that's, we, we're going to have to think about that one because we got we got to come up with a good one. Well, because... it's like actor, but actors already kind of <laughs> taken. You know what I'm saying? Okay, cool. So here, let's see what uh, let's see what else uh, let's see what else uh, homeboy had to say. How do you pronounce his name again? Corbett. Corbett. That was brother it. Corbett. Brother Corbett. Okay. So here we go, brother Corbett. Clip for my man, my man Corbett. Activism or advocacy directed toward or against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is a secular, worldly device misapplied in a spiritual, otherworldly context. Oh, a secular device misapplied. Let's just keep going. It, it just gets better. Oh, that was the end of the clip. Man, dude, look, you stop them at the exact same place that <laughs> I stop them, familiar man. phrase. You know, oh, whoops. Queer philosophy. So, so oh. now I think we're getting into uh, an example of this sort of activism that, that I've seen out there. So do you want to go I'm over not, some of these or it's going to take us forever? It's like a 20 minute video. You yeah. yeah if, you, if you, if you want to, if you want to skip it, you can, I'll let you make that call. But, uh, some of these have to deal with, with, uh, examples of activism that we see. Okay. So what's an example you see here? Let's just great. Let me see. Which one are you going to throw up here? What's an example that you see? Let's just do it. Go ahead and play, ahead and play that one that was, uh, that was just coming and we'll talk dead. about it. Okay, cool. So here, here's an example you see being alone. Even if you don't have a calling with a lot of influence on policy, please consider how you can help in whatever capacity you can. For example, host a special fireside. So I've invited to the foyer two so authors. Let's pause real quick right here. Wow. Okay. So this is a book called Queer Mormon Theology okay. by someone named Blair Osler. Okay. Blair Osler is a bisexual woman, a uh, Latter-day Saint, who has written an entire book that basically is academic queer theory applied to Latter-day Saint theology. Okay. okay. Now you might listen to that and say, well, that sounds a little bit not like our doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she literally has a chapter in the book that's all about how we can queer the church, essentially, how we can actually push this stuff into the church. And, and she's so literally she's saying, saying you need to hold special firesides. Yes. And here's what's, what's wild. You're now about to listen to a clip from one of the number one academics in our church, Dr. Patrick Mason, hosting her and Taylor Petrie, both queer activists, 
um, hosting them on his podcast to promote this book. Whoa. So literally we've got a book written about queer polyamorous relationships, right? Because this is Blair Osler. Wasn't she the one that advocated for like two lesbians and a guy to be able to have a thruple temple queer ceiling? Polygamy. Yep. Queer polygamy. Okay, cool. Which is actually somewhat is actually reasonable because if it's just consenting adults is the standard for what well it's the logical conclusion of everything that they've been pushing for like so i at least appreciate that it's like when atheists don't admit that like literally you can have no moral judgments if you go truly atheist and believe there is no god you know and they don't want to go there because they don't want to admit what the actual end of the slippery slope and the logical conclusions are at least like these people are taking to the end of their logical conclusions. I, and that's why I actually you know? admire Blair Osler. Even yeah. though we're on totally different sides of the spectrum, I admire that she goes where the other people won't. But the thing is, is that if you advocate for gay marriage and all the rest of it, and literally your standard is just consenting adults who love each other and want yeah. to be with each other, well, she's bisexual. If her true identity is a bisexual woman, then she can't fulfill her nature Unless she's able to have sexual relations with both a male and a female. Yeah. Okay. So this is really interesting. So literally in this book, they say you need to become an activist against the church. And then Patrick Mason, you say interviews her. Listen, I want to hear this. To him I'm going to hear this. Um, you know what? We're just going to press play and let the audience decide. I've never heard this before. Let's see. Uh, two terrific uh, new books. Paradigm shifting books, I would say. Okay. Uh, so we've got Blair Osler with us and also Taylor Petrie. And Dr. Petrie may be best known for his work advocating for a post heterosexual Mormon theology. Okay. So now that was kind of a nothing burger, bro. You didn't have any smoking guns on that clip of anything so, really crazy, so keep, they said. Keep, keep, keep it going. This is keep going? the whole episode with Patrick Mason where he talks with them both. And it is nothing but praise. And wow, this is really profound stuff. And, okay. And, and anyway, just just continue to listen to what she talks about during this interview. Okay. First, I would just say when we think about what is the church going to be like, I just want to first acknowledge and say that we are the church. And we don't want to give up our pen in the authorship of the future of the church. We are making these decisions, too. We are influencing the way things go in these conversations. When we go to gospel doctrine, we are writing the future. So what way the church is going to go? That's up to us. Say heavenly Did, parents whenever possible. Okay. Well, pause it real quick. All right. So the future is up to us. We got to write the authorship of what the church is going to be. Remember, this isn't top down. The Lord is going to reveal through his prophets and we're going to follow the savior, Jesus Christ. This is, we need to get in and be activists toward the church. Now, remember her whole chapter is about like, here's how we get out there and change the ideas of the church about sexuality and gender. And, and basically uh, to use an actual word from queer theory and queer activists talk about queering things, right? Okay. You want to, she said you want to queer a phrase. That's actually a, an academic term that the queer activists use. And so if you actually back up a little bit in this next little segment, I have some quote from her book where she's talking about things you can do to help, you know, be an activist in the church and try and subvert the, uh, the 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 family proclamation and the other things in the in the church as much as you can and change gender roles and all the rest of it okay interesting so um all right we'll just play this last clip and uh see see if this is as big a smoking gun as you say it is dog let's see here by leaving the trajectory open to diverse experiences gender oh, identities uh, and families go back a little bit i want to start from the very beginning of that clip okay right here up to us Say heavenly parents whenever possible. By leaving the trajectory open to diverse experiences, genders, identities, and family structures, young women and queer youth can more fully see that eternal families are diverse. Talk about women in the priesthood. Don't shy away from it. Integrate the sexes beyond heteronormative assumptions about orientation and attraction. Oh, wow. This is literally so like saying- the psychology of gender, a.k.a. man-hating 101, taught at BYU 
Uh, just sold at Deseret Book now. Interesting. Okay, keep going. Well, this this book, to be fair, is not sold at Deseret Book, but oh. it is definitely embraced by top scholars like Patrick Mason, uh, Richard Osler, Papa Osler, as he's known, is a huge fan of Blair's and has had her on his podcast. Well, that's just Osler times. pride. Yeah, I mean, well, you got to stick. That these guys. It's like me these, and you know Pierre Cardin. It's like Cardin Cardin. There is in the church an activist class who don't like the family proclamation because they do not believe that homosexual behavior is sinful, and therefore they want to redefine marriage within the church so that gay couples can be fully included in the church. And they believe they look at themselves the same way they they look at themselves like the people prior to the the priesthood ban being lifted who wanted blacks to receive the priesthood. They see this as an an equivalent issue. And so they are out in the church agitating against the family proclamation all the time. That's what these books and that's what she's talking about doing, you know, we want to try and you know, we want to talk about different gender experiences, identities, family structures. Um, and and she's not talking about, you know, like a single mom getting remarried and having some stepkids. Like she's talking about actual, like really radical ideas about family and structure. And okay. So I, I guess in my mind, I think there's better examples of how corrosive this activism can be to me this maybe it was just because of narr- narr- narrated by what seemed to be a sweet junior high uh, debate team person you know what i'm <laughs> saying where it's just kind of like oh that's cute they're trying to do some kind of activism that's like cute activism what i'm worried about is like the really negative toxic stuff where like john delin is glorifying men who have left their wives see, but that's no 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 but but see this like <laughs> cardin you're missing the yeah. point the of course point I. here is that the insidious activism isn't John DeLynn. Like we all know John DeLynn for what he is. Oh. The insidious activism is the is the activism that is working to very intentionally but very subtly to try and Are you saying I got duped not realizing it? I was getting duped by the You're junior high brother. debate team and, voice. And in this next clip, it, it, I have a, a a clip here of so Patrick Mason after the um, after the Elder Holland thing, Patrick Mason did a uh, a podcast with the Faith Matters group. And is that the one where he said that we need to do bottom up activism? Basically, and- yes. And he was talking, and Tom Christofferson mm-hmm. uh, is there in the conversation. And play that clip. I think it's really interesting. It's the next clip here. Okay, awesome. Here we go. It's going to get played. And just just pay attention, everyone, to the way they view revelation, if it's top down coming from the Lord or if they have to do something to induce the revelation. Okay. Interesting. Here we go. I don't think we have the answers yet. I think we have to, we're we're looking for conversations like this, the conversations there, but the prayers that have been said over the past two weeks, the prayers that elder Holland said that he and his, you know, brethren and the leadership offer, you know, daily, that's how we're going to get there because the Lord's going to give us more revelation. We're not there yet okay. where we're at right now. We, 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 we can't stay here. Yeah. Uh, cause, cause the gap is too big. We can't stay here. Okay. He's okay. talking about our current doctrine of the family, the current family proclamation situation. The idea here is that we can't stay where we are with the normal doctrine of the family. Cause it just hurts too many gay people. And so we have to, basically seek the lord's revelation we can't stay here and it's like well i have nothing no. wrong. there's nothing wrong with seeking the lord's revelation i looked at that exact no, same what podcast. if the lord has already given his answer well then that's different i i don't feel i do i don't feel that like the prophets have come out and said like look we've honestly inquired and 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 we've received an answer and spiritually for the uh, at least the short term. The this, family this proclamation is not an answer from the Lord as to what the Lord's standard are for uh, the, family and I, sexual I, relations. No, no, I, I think it is, but but there's n- nothing. I, if it's been twenty five years, I think it's okay to ask again without being the the the, the dude. No, that's, I I actually you know, would say it, this has been answered in scripture. Like there's nothing like it's fine. It's, it's like going and asking like, hey, Lord. I, I just haven't heard you recently say that look, I can't look, all, beat look, my dog. All I'm saying, all I'm saying, <laughs> bro, all I'm saying is that if I were prophet, you know, I'd come out and I, in good faith, 
I'd want to tell these people that are also operating in good faith, I feel like, hey, look, I can see why there are well-intentioned arguments uh, for this. I don't think I think you've got some blind spots and those blind spots are informed by uh, a a North American, especially Western elitist uh, and suburban worldview that may not be taking into consideration A, B, C and D. I line out what A, B, C and D are. And then I'd say we've taken this seriously because we love you and we love our uh, gay members and so on and so forth. And, you know, the Lord hasn't given us any individual light. And this is a theocracy. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I say? Like, I'm sorry, but at some point you have to get comfortable with that if you're a member of the church. You know what I'm saying? Well, actually, it's not a theocracy because technically the Lord chooses who it is. It's not just the Pope unilaterally. And 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 if you add that supernatural element, theocracy is not the actual correct word to use. But kingdom of God is a kingdom. And kings, you know what I'm saying, don't exactly hold election days, if you get what I'm saying. So there is that frustrating, especially for people like me, who is huge into democratically elected representative republics like the United States of America. And I think it's a very difficult pill to swallow, especially for the elites of our country um, who are so used to getting where they want to get by rallying the troops and advocating for the cause. You know what I'm saying? Albeit incorrectly or correctly, it's it's a difficult square peg to fit into a circular hole, if you get what I'm saying. So um, later on in that podcast, I noticed that Patrick Mason said we need to engage in bottom up activism towards the church as a way to uh, affect positive change, which unfortunately has two wildly arrogant insinuations in it. First, that you know more of God's will for his children than the people running your church, which is, that's a pretty big pill to swallow, even for an audacious man like me who thinks he's smarter than everybody in the room. Even I would not quite engage in that one. Okay. And then second off, um, it, it kind of does put you yourself up as the new mediator between goodness and God and man and the leaders of the church, you literally become your own de facto Christ by Mm -hmm. saying we, the activists are the ones that know what's really right. And God, if he is a loving God, will agree with us. And I'm going to hold his goodness and his godliness and my church's godliness hostage until they agree with me, which is kind of a form of spiritual terrorism, you know? And it's, it's ugly. And I don't like it when people hold other people's humanity hostage unless they agree with them politically or spiritually, which is what ATC is doing and what Brother Garrett spoke out against. That's why it's awesome. Okay, moving on to the next clip. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, yeah. but uh, let's probably jump back, get back to to, uh, Brother Corbett stuff. Clip nine, I think it's around uh, eight minutes. If you want to go there. Go to clip nine around eight minutes. I am at your will, my friend. Here we go. Eight oh six, I think, is where it's at. All right, I'm 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 bumping it out right now. Eight zero six, boom. Here you go. Clip nine. To further distinguish this method from our valued brothers and sisters, as I speak of this entity, I will give it its own initials. Oh, ATC. Oh, he did it. Activism toward the church. Yep. And I think so. So when I was saying that he did it with balls of steel without announcing it first, (laughs) it was really because I was an idiot that didn't listen first. Right. But he also when he when he does this and he he does it, he says he wants to separate the ideas from the people. And that's something that I'm super big on. Okay, like when I'm talking about Patrick Mason or I'm talking about Blair Osler, like I don't have anything against these people. Okay, I I just recognize that (laughs) some of their methods and ideas fall under ATC. It, it, these people are agitating within the church in order to try and get change by hosting firesides and using the term heavenly parents instead of heavenly father and 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 um, doing things like uh, uh, confusing gender and constantly talking about this to try and undermine what we already know and cause people to constantly question things that already have been answered. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I like that you really do that. I like that uh, Brother Garrett actually really emphasized that 
Because I think it is easy for somebody to be swept up, especially in a media promoted narrative and think that what they're doing is right and engage in negative activism in a misguided way. I I think it's very possible to be very easily misguided in this world. And so Blair said in her thing, she said, we are the church. You know, it's kind of like we are the people we know. (laughs) Yeah. We are followers. That's the of problem Jesus of starting a sense. church in America, dog. Like, I mean, we are the great <laughs> North American religion. You know what I'm saying? Like, no what people don't realize that. There's no real American faith. Lutherism coming out of Germany. You know, a vast swaths of Protestantism coming out of England. You know, there the, the great North American choir is Motab. Why? Because the great North American religion is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's no other major world religion that was founded here. For heaven's sakes, the Pope lives in Rome, Italy, and their official language is Italian. So, you know, like, when you start a religion in America, don't be surprised when you got activists and marchers out there saying, we the people are going to tell leadership how to do these things. We got to unionize. <laughs> you exactly. know what I'm no, saying? That's, and that's very much sort of the mentality here. It's this bottom-up, we the people are going to push back uh, against the brethren. And so... Let's but but the problem here is, is that what is a Christian? A Christian is a humble disciple of Jesus Christ. In other words, we're not pushing our agenda. We're following him. Now, if we go to clip number 10, yeah, let's or around it. about 12 minutes 12, or 12, uh, 1230 ish. OK, this is where he talks about the problem with that sort of mentality. This sort of, uh, you know, we're going to lead it. And what it does is people disconnect leaders from Jesus Christ. And, okay. and, 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 and he does an excellent job of explaining how this all plays out. Okay, let's watch it. Here we go. In my experience, ATC rarely starts by saying, don't have faith in Jesus Christ. Rather, it diminishes faith in Christ and trust in God. Oh, P.S. I'm just going to pause right there for a second. Whoever is coughing in that room yeah. just <laughs> lost an organ. I mean, for heaven's I sakes, like whoever just literally left a kidney on the table and then hacked up a left lung needs to come do clean up in aisle four because that was the most heinous cough I've ever heard in my life. In fact, dude, we got to go back. I'm literally going to just rewind this for like 10 seconds just, to him. just so we can cough. hear that cough again because that was absolutely gnarly. Here we go. Saying, don't have faith in Jesus Christ. Rather, it diminishes faith in Christ and trust in God indirectly. (laughs) Its pattern is to first undermine faith in church leaders. Now, perhaps you have heard of James C. Jones. Oh, there he is. So let's let's pause it real quick before I run off and tell my next thing. So he's saying that it doesn't start by undermining faith in Christ. It starts by undermining faith in leaders. And so I hear, and this is from a, a video that I did on my channel, Thoughtful Faith, look it up, subscribe. Uh-huh. Um, and I did a video on BYU and things that are going on there. And, and there's a lot of activism going on at BYU, a okay. um, lot of ATC. And, and, and this clip is an example of uh, a guy named James uh, C. Jones, uh, who is a radical critical theory activist. And anyway, play play that clip and maybe move it to the very beginning so you can hear what he says. Okay, let's see what he's got to say. Look at that guy in his cheap ESPN sports jacket. Pattern is to first undermine faith in church leaders. Now, perhaps you have heard of James C. Jones. He is a member of the church and a prominent critical race activist who publicly called Elder Holland satanic. And Whoa. other apostles, quote, homophobic white leaders born in the Jim Crow era. But that did not stop the Maxwell Institute from inviting him to speak. And in Jeez. that meeting, they discussed ways that they could help him get his critical race training program sold to wards and stakes in the church. Is that true? 100%. Get the Maxwell Institute paid for by tithing dollars at BYU. Literally is pubbing a dude that calls Elder Holland satanic. 
after he said it. This wasn't before. This was. I've it, never criticized Uchtdorf for those really crappy donations <laughs> to Raphael <laughs> Killer Warnock. All right, you know what I'm saying. I, I mean, oh, I yeah, ain't no, never no, called they, him they, Satan. They notice, notice. Whoa. Notice what he's attacking. He's attacking and for two hundred dollars. <laughs> that, that socialist garbage ain't worth two hundred dollars. That's the most. That's the. That's the thing about all these freaking wannabe Marxists and socialists. They're such filthy, blood sucking capitalists. Who sells a PowerPoint presentation for two hundred dollars? That grift is off of Boomer Mormons who are too dumb to recognize that that PowerPoint presentation is a bunch of ideological garbage they could get for twenty five cents on YouTube. And he's saying he's socialist and in it for the cause while he's charging 200 bones what yeah but hey that's the ward rate. individually you'd be paying 79 dollars uh, oh so it's it's worse than progressive taxation that gets more expensive as you go up you know what i'm saying oh no no i get it. it is going more expensive as well, you go I'm, up. i'm just i i wow. hope that the uh that he you know i i definitely can't think of a better use of tithing money than to have that guy educating okay. us on race relations okay so let's continue with the unwokening where do we, where do we continue with the unwokening just what con clip, continue to play it it, it goes on here oh this has more oh this is painful okay here we go clip 11 hit it but this distrust is the very opposite of the faith the Lord requires of his covenant people in himself, his prophets and apostles, and those they direct. He established his apostles as an extension of himself. Jesus prayed that they, his apostles, may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, Rock that on. they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now it's his turn to cough up that lung, dude. <laughs> Elsewhere he revealed, he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my father. Wherefore, meaning the church, the Lord said, Thou shalt give heed unto all the prophets' words and commandments, for his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. Okay. Eh? He said, whether by my... You chose a really boring clip, dog. Does this just keep going? What are you talking about? This is okay. a, like a critical moment. Like, if you don't get this, this is, this is like the heart of the talk. He's saying that the Savior has appointed these servants to act in his stead as his representatives. If you reject Christ's servants on the earth, it's as if you are rejecting Christ. He says, those who receive you receive me. Okay. okay. So if you are undermining faith in the, in the people that the Lord has sent, his agents, you are undermining faith in him now this is where this is in critically important to remember and i like to use this analogy i've thought a lot about it lately oh so all right here it comes dude. here, here it comes buckle up buckle up <laughs> okay so people a lot of times are like oh well you can't like criticize the brethren like that's really cultish and weird in a way i can see where they're coming from but let's twitch this around how about the military are you allowed in the military to just say whatever you want? No. Drop down and give me 20. <laughs> Are you allowed to criticize the president of the United States if you're in the military? Are you allowed to publicly go out and say that he's a total idiot? Uh, well, nowadays you are because wokeism has kind of provided that cover, <laughs> but traditionally well, you aren't. Technically, no. And, yeah. and it's we against all the understand rules. that there's a good reason for that. There's a thing called institutional, institutional strength. In oh, Institutional integrity. Yeah. It's actually critically important. Because if you don't have institutional integrity, you end up in a situation where you end up with Protestantism. <laughs> you end up with everyone getting mad at the leaders and going off and starting their own thing. So so you would have been an anti-Lutheran Catholic 
in the 15th century. You would have been like taking down those 95 theses saying, I listen, know, I, boy. Yeah, I would I would have been like, look, we got to we got to <laughs> reform the Catholic Church, but still be the Catholic Church because I believe in priesthood authority because. But see, that's the thing. That's what separates us from the Protestants. These activists don't realize this has already been done. It was done in the 1500s and a whole lot of people died. So yeah. let's let's not go down that route. There's a thing of when you begin to, I have no problem with following, you know, if there's a problem in the military, there are in the military proper channels to let concerns be known. And not only that, good military leaders will listen to their subordinates, get feedback from them, counsel with them, all things we're taught in the church in order to achieve the mission. But we always remember that we don't want to undermine the mission because we disagree with something about a leader or they're not perfect or they made a mistake or whatever. At some point, your criticism of leadership hurts the mission of the church. Just like in the military, your unwillingness to sustain your leaders undermines the mission. Okay. So, so, so that... If people don't understand the need for institutional integrity, they haven't thought about it. And when you undermine the leaders of the church, you undermine the work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so here we go. Let him finish. In my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Oh, well, it was right there at the end. Again, you just chose the cool killer clip at the right moment, man. <laughs> so here's the la uh, is this the last clip right here? I believe it's clip number 12. Clip number 12. In yeah, my observations. Was, uh, go ahead. Here it is. In his observations. Such lack of faith inevitably leads to letting go of the church entirely. And he just said, he just said the logical conclusion of all of this wokeism. He just said the logical conclusion of progmos, progressive Mormonism, whatever you want to call it. it. It ultimately ends with just letting go of the church. Like that, that is the only logical conclusion that can happen but, when you but engage. But he keeps going because it isn't just about losing the church. Yeah, he, now he oh. backs it up. I just want to say that I thought that was glorious. I thought it was glory, glorious that he didn't just see all of these old leaders, these post-war wealthy elite leaders, you know what I'm saying, that have never had to actually fight for much of anything, uh, at least in terms of their faith. You know, they, they they're so... I read a quote today. I can't remember who it was by, but he said, there's no greater act than to stare the devil in the face and call him a devil. You know what I'm saying? I can't remember who said that. I'll have to look it up who it is, but it's like a good one. I feel like for 50 years, our leadership hasn't been willing to just stare down the face of the devil and actually call the devil a devil. So look, uh, the greatest act, uh, Okay, is to call the devil the devil. There's this really cool um, YouTuber called Popo Medic or something like that that did um, a video on the 1992 riots and the mm -hmm. 1986 FBI shootout, which I can't remember what it was, but he had those quotes. But anyway, I am totally digressing here. Let's go back to Homeboy uh, and, and finish the unwokening right here. Losing the testimony of Jesus. Hence, ATC often indirectly undermines faith in Jesus Christ. Savage. Boom. 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 Now here, this is the formula. He's laid it out. Okay. Here's how it works. First of all, point out something that's either real or perceived unfair. Okay? Use that unfairness to stoke resentment and feelings of anger. Really get people emotionally charged over something, right? Yeah. Then... Next step is to begin advocating and 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 kind of get the mob together. This is unfair. Let's, you know, unionize, you know, yeah. that kind of thing, right? Except for unionization is cool. This is just exactly. like really hateful, <laughs> angry, depressive crap. You know what I'm saying? We're going to talk about that because he, yeah. he actually addresses that, that aspect of it. This causes people to lose faith in the leaders of the church because they don't believe that the leaders of the church are doing what they're supposed to do. And then what does that do? When they lose faith in the leaders, they lose faith in the church. When you lose faith in the church, you eventually lose faith in Christ. When people leave the church, they aren't going and becoming Baptists. They're leaving Christ. They're abandoning the Savior. And so what he points out so brilliantly, 
is how this subtly Cardin, don't get duped by it. Me! This subtleness indirectly harnesses people's good impulses against injustice and unfairness and it harnesses it to draw people away from the doctrine of Christ because that ultimately is the way that you affect change. You don't affect change through secular advocacy within the church. This isn't what we do. Okay. Um, can I go on to the next clip now, Mr. Hansen? Is yeah, that okay but let's with jump you? up. Let's jump ahead just for the sake of time. <laughs> okay. Let's go to, to clip 15. All right. Which should be right around. Got it. You got 15? Yeah, you ready? Go for it. Hit Boom it. shakalaka. Here it goes. Discipleship also recognizes that fundamentally, as Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught, faith is all. That's the musket guy. We don't listen to him anymore. No, I just can't keep going. Always pointed toward the future. Borrowing Alma's language, discipleship looks forward with an eye of faith and views the Lord's promises of perfect peace and harmony, for example, among all God's children, fulfilled. It then acts in faith to bring to pass such a vision. We might say ATC, on the other hand, looks backward with an eye of judgment and condemns. I thought the white people were going to be a little better and not as bad as they are. Oh, you just literally juxtaposed what Gar uh, uh, Elder Gareth said about ATC. With the black menace on BYU, oh, you're gonna piss a lot of people off, dog. Keep keep it going. Oh, keep it. Go There's more. Oh my goodness gracious, I'm gonna get just thrown under the bus here. But that's what happens when you invite Jacob Hansen on your show. Or looks sideways with an eye of scorn and finds fault. I know it's gonna be just racist, honestly. I just kind of came here thinking that my faith was gonna get strengthened. But here we are. Because it watches for iniquity, ATC sits on the trash heap of disappointing history, recycling others' real or imagined sins and shortcomings. Yeah, so, so, uh, basically exactly what Brother Corbett's talking about. Yeah. Wow. Hardcore. And you know, it's so sad too, because it's like nowadays you see Russell M. Nelson like sitting and hugging the NAACP president as the rest of the world has completely forsaken the NAACP, the original gangster of civil rights, no longer really donating or giving them any kind of relevance. You know, here's like mm -hmm. Russell M. Nelson actually hugging the guy and besties with him. Mm -hmm. Right. Meanwhile, they're all pouring out dollars after dollars for Black Lives Matter. So Patrice Cullors and the other CFOs and CEOs can go buy literal mansions, two, three, eight million dollar mansions in Topanga Canyon, 20 miles from my house in a neighborhood I can only ever aspire to live in. So it's like, I mean, when he says he sits on the trash heap of historical, real or misperceived sins and then just recycles them. That's so true because I got to tell you, that's, I really question what is a more racist act in 2022? Not allowing young people to think in a 21st century framework about their spirituality and join the Mormon church because you keep shoving past sins in their face of previous leaders and telling them that just like John DeLynn did, if they, if they join the Mormon church, they're self-loathing total stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, that, Oh, they're only there because they speak well, not like other black kids speak. Like, uh, what was her name? Oof. Um, Oof, that was rough. Meredith, who was the, who was the, uh, uh, Madeline Liebrick was the name of the, 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 the girl that said that. And, um, I, I mean, I don't know what's more racist this recycling of this past crap in order to like traumatize modern youth. All right. Or just simply letting people think for themselves and have a spiritual journey with God. That's about them and their God, not about their race that you keep shoving in their face. Well, and it's totally pointing at again, undermining the leaders. Now here's the thing. There isn't, that's not to say there isn't racism and problems in the past, but it's sort of like, 
are what team are you on here? We have a mission to achieve and going there and harping over the past racist statements by church leaders in the past isn't helping to advance the cause of Christ. Okay. And 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 that's sort of what he's really getting at. Now, I'd like to go back actually. I think you played clip 16. Oh, can, whoops, did I? Yeah, but it's okay. We can go back to clip 15. It'll it'll work just fine. So, it should be around uh 17 minutes. Okay, it's 17 minutes. Here we go, my man. 1702. Oh, you know what? That five when it was blurry did look like a six. I totally yeah, apologize. But here we go. Clip 15. Right there in black and white. Because ATC rejects church leaders and their counsel, usually openly, it must somehow preserve a sense of religious sincerity or authenticity to effectively influence others. Thus, it produces catchphrases such as, I don't follow the brethren. I follow Jesus Christ. By the way, let's all be honest here. He could have chose much better slogans, but I, I, I have a feeling that, that, that whoever approved this speech came down and was like, okay, don't you dare say Black Lives Matter. Don't you dare say believe all women. Don't you dare say the other 15 million hashtags that have proven wildly destructive to our society and really have not garnered any kind of goodness for the people they purport to represent. You know what I'm saying? I guarantee you the original slogan he had in there was not that slogan. And somebody, some diversity reader came down and was like, heck no no to this <laughs> but that but that but he, what he's saying is you hear it all the time right ultimately i follow christ and you know the yeah. brethren you know it's and you that. hold the brethren's humanity and christianity hostage until they agree with you because you follow christ yes but let's keep playing it because I, I have an example here from somebody that said something along these lines Oh man are you gonna get me in trouble on my own freaking podcast again dog here we go it's important to say oh! heavenly parents from earthly leaders. You did it. But these dangerous claims are as counter to Jesus's own teachings as they are confused. Wait, hold on real quick. Pause it. Go back to the beginning of that. ATC does where not. She ended and he starts. So oh. she says we need to decouple earthly leaders from the Savior. Okay. So basically we need to follow Jesus, not the leaders, and we need to make some distinctions there. Now there's a, there's a sense to which that's understandable, but... He's pointing out that that line of thinking, you got to be very careful with that. Because if you start undermining the credibility of the leaders, you're decoupling them from Christ. And that's what he addresses in this next part. So just continue. Okay, so here we go, my man. You just get me in all kinds of trouble, dog. Get me in all kinds of trouble. Here we go. I'm just going to play the clip again so people can understand the juxtaposition that you suggested. Because ATC rejects church leaders and their counsel, usually openly, it must somehow preserve a sense of religious sincerity or authenticity to effectively influence others. Thus, it produces catchphrases such as, I don't follow the brethren, I follow Jesus Christ. It's important to separate heavenly parents from earthly leaders. But these dangerous claims are as counter to Jesus' own teachings as they are confused. ATC does not realize that he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And Boom. if they if Oof. they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. All right, that one was pretty tough, right there. You said boom. What made you say boom, my man? Made me say boom is because he just dropped the dropped the hammer on it. It's so, like so. You, do you, you think don't realize that Jesus Christ acts through servants? This is something that when you start going the Protestant route, you're ignoring the scriptures. The Catholics got it right in the Catholic Protestant debate. The Catholics have some problems, but the Catholics have it right that Jesus Christ very specifically talks about how he acts through his authorized servants. And we as Latter-day Saints, if it's in our core DNA as Latter-day Saints and doctrine, is the idea of priesthood keys and the role that that ballsy claim dog you just literally said the catholics got it right in the catholic versus protestant argument you're like the great schism was wrong and this side was right <laughs> you know what i'm saying i dig it man you got some cojones dude but it's so, true and that's our big thing we are very similar is it as true as the crappy white balance on your camera what the was key, that? Is it as true as the crappy white balance on your yeah, camera that's no, turned I, you yellow? To fix that. I've told Pardon you to fix it guys. every single time you get on my show because I maintain <laughs> high production value and it sucks that you keep going. You're like orange mad bad. You're the new orange man. Oh, 
Mormonism oh, no. found his own orange man bad. And it's Jacob like Hansen. Move, try and change the white balance. All right. Don't get labeled. Okay, so but now no. clip 16. Oh, we already played clip no, 16. No, we already did that. So let's. So the next thing he talks about is, is so so we have been talking about how activism is, is bad when it's directed towards the church. But what's really cool about this talk was that he actually talks about that activism is not wrong, right? So let's go to clip, um, let's go to clip five. Okay. We're going to actually go back here. Back. Okay. I'm going to clip five, my man. Let me, let me see if I can find the timestamp on it. It looks like it's at. I found 4.3. So look, clip five is going to be coming up next. And I see you've got just a who's who of everybody. Yeah, it's a nine. You. It's nine point uh, nine nine forty seven. Okay, what I'm cool. For clip I'm five. here. Are you ready? Okay, nine forty seven. Clip five. If we didn't play it, here it goes. Boom shakalaka. To be sure, change is needed in our church. For example, members of the first presidency and quorum of the twelve have spoken out against prejudice in any form. The Savior organized his church in large part to effect change of many kinds in God's children. Okay. But change in the kingdom of God is not accomplished in the same way as change in, say, government. Yeah. Yep. That's, That's literally it. what we were saying just like, yeah, 20 minutes ago. Keep going. Yep, and in government, it can actually be quite good to be involved in advocacy. Go ahead and uh, and just play the next clip. Okay, here we go, and then we're gonna wrap it up soon, right? Yeah, yeah. This will be some of the last. We have a couple more clips, and then we'll go. We'll wrap it up. Is Brother Corbett saying activism and advocacy are bad? Not at all. Like all Americans, and arguably most people on Earth, you and I and our families are beneficiaries of activism. The United States was founded on and through activism and advocacy by activists. Yeah, baby. The Boston Tea Party. We got to unionize. No representation. I mean, no taxation without representation. <laughs> got to unionize. The formation of the Continental Congress and the Revolutionary War were all forms of activism. Dude, between people coughing up lungs and having 1990s Nokia like <laughs> alerts that are set to like 5000 volume, somebody's got to get somebody's got to get a hold of this crowd, man. Seriously. And we have an angelic let's go, right, validation. So let's go on, I think clip 17 now. Go ahead and play it. Okay, go to clip 17. What's the timestamp, my man? It's the it's the next one, I believe. So 21 uh or, or uh 11 minutes. Okay, so at 11 minutes we got clip 17. Here we go. Boom. The Lord has brought about significant change in his church through appropriate means and methods. Let me conclude with these couple mentions. Although these changes have affected all members of the body of Christ, time permits mention of just a very few. Without fanfare, some have encouraged the removal of folklore about people of African descent from among the literature of the kingdom. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Okay. We all know that the church has changed its position relative to certain ideas about why the priesthood ban was enacted. Yeah. Okay. And there were people who were working behind the scenes and definitely had opinions and conversations going on about that. Yeah, right? but they were all they were people in authority called by God working behind and the scenes. And they were in council with their they were within the channels that exist within the church. See, what you got to realize is, again, think about the military. You can have complaints and want to make changes to the way things are going about accomplishing a mission. But there's a line at which you you cross over from speaking within the channels of authority that exist within the structures of the institution. And then when you actually undermine the institution itself, because you have an opinion on the way the mission needs to be run. So when Kwaku says that the Mormon church is an interplanetary military order, like <laughs> he's not, he's not off. He's not, he's not too far off. I think, you I know, think he's, he's probably off, but maybe at least a not as off as your crappy white balance, but let's keep going. Not as bad. Man, yeah. Orange really man, bad. really bad, dude. This is really bad. Tonight. <laughs> yeah. We got to fix this. <laughs> okay. So, uh, one more clip. Do we have time just for one more and then we finish? Okay. If we're going to go to the, the last clip here, okay? I want it. Let's do it. Let's go to clip number 19. It's at the very end. He asked some questions that I think are critical that they're at the end of his talk 
where he talks about the uh, kind of, is it ATC or is this healthy uh, stuff within the church? Okay, cool, sweet. Meaning everyone involved to the past or present. Oh, clip 19, right here. Let us help our valiant friends consider the following questions as they decide whether to pursue a cause or follow a particular approach. Does it promote the doctrine of Christ in our lives? Does it build faith in Christ, his atonement? Let's, let's pause his... real quick. I, I want to make a okay. mention on this one. The doctrine of Christ. He's been talking about it the whole time we've been talking about it. We haven't defined it. Okay? Yeah. Jesus Christ in 3 Nephi 11 says his doctrine. He says, and this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me, and the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father in me. And it basically, and it, this is the doctrine, and whoso, whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And whosoever believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. And there's a good talk uh, given by um, Brian K. Ashton on the doctrine of Christ, and he defined it. Um, the scriptures define the doctrine of Christ as exercising faith in Jesus Christ, his atonement, repenting, being baptized, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. In other words, it's a change. If you want to affect change, change needs to come from the inside out. The focus of the doctrine of Christ is that we change ourselves first, and then we inspire change in others through the Spirit of God, helping them to also place their faith in Jesus Christ and manifest that faith through repentance, entering into covenants, and being transformed by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because I always tell people whenever they talk about wanting to engage in activism against the church, I always say, well, good luck, first off, because let me tell you, there's no group out there on earth that is better able to hunker down against perceived persecution than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, some <laughs> Jewish people, and some like solid Catholics. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, th th those three people will survive the apocalypse because they're just like, oh, persecution ain't no thing. <laughs> Nero already threw us in the freaking Colosseum. We, we actually you do know? well against persecution. Yeah, now, Jews that, literally have a phrase where they say like, our holidays are literally... They tried to kill us. They failed. Now we celebrate. You know what I'm saying? Like that's like 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 80 percent of the high holy days is some empire tried to kill the Jewish people. They failed. God saved them. Now they celebrate. Right. And then Mormons. Come on. We were literally drove. We had an extermination order in Missouri set out against us. Besides the American Indians and African Americans were the only group of people that you could legally slaughter as cattle. And it was only counted as like personal property. So ain't no thing for us to recognize persecution from without right and I always tell people I say activism didn't bring the priesthood ban away it was not pressure from without it wasn't title IX pressure like all the politically engaged people want to think it wasn't social pressure like all of the social activists like to think it wasn't feminism like all the feminists like to think it was actually pressure from within so many uh, so many members of African descent in countries that just weren't riddled with the same segregation problems America was were getting baptized in Brazil particularly they're yeah. having so many members that were being born that were half African half whatever a quarter this quarter that uh, can we call this guy to be bishop because he's on fire but he's a quarter black I don't know what to do I give him a temple ring, you know? and quickly the church realized this priesthood ban is utterly ridiculous if it's keeping people from being able to go and make covenants that are on spiritual fire already baptized and already Bingo. enduring to the end you so you're never going to focusing that focuses on the doctrine of christ yes and it's not christ, from without it's from it's, within you're right and and the thing is is i think the doctrine of christ obviously we we, we talked about it but ezra Taft benson's famous quote it says i think this sums it up beautifully the doctrine of christ it says the lord works from the inside out the world in other words the secular activist types uh, works from the outside in. The world would take people out of slums. Christ takes the slums out of people, and then they take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. 
See, Ooh, advocacy yeah. is about trying to get outside in pressure to change things where the doctrine of Christ says, put your faith in Christ, repent and let him do the work. Okay. He will cause the changes as we change ourselves. So, so what do we do with all this now, man? We got a new acronym, ATC. Are we just going to have an alert like the old bomberos did, like the old firemen, the volunteer firemen did in the 1920s, where somebody rang the bell when there was a fire and all the volunteer firemen started the bucket line and started just like pouring water <laughs> on the bucket? Are we going to have a little volunteer ATC fireman squad? So just Jacob Hansen could be like, ATC alert, ATC alert. And then all of us run and grab buckets and douse the person or like, what do we do, man? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally opposed to that. Here's the yeah. thing. When, when ATC rears its ugly head, we need to recognize that within the ranks of the church, there, it, there are channels for which we work within. If someone in the military was going and disobeying orders or subverting the orders of the commanders of the military, you got to be really careful about that because at some point it affects the mission. And if you're affecting the mission of bringing people into covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, are you helping people to make and keep covenants with Christ? You know, part that's, of reason- that's the litmus test. So if part- you're not, if it, if you're, if what you're doing isn't helping that, then wrong. Yeah. So it's just funny to me before we wrap up here, I just have to point out that like, I'm smiling throughout this podcast because it's hilarious to see like a guy like you that's generally slightly rebellious and a dude like me who's like wildly rebellious against certain things like completely being all about the institutional strength you know what i'm saying like like being against activism uh when put in its right like it's such a funny funny thing that somebody who's so pro individualism can be so anti activism in very specific and certain regards. It's literally almost comical that we're having this conversation. Well, yeah, I will. You know what I'm saying? Brother Corbett hits it. He says that activism, our sort of, you know, challenge the authorities and all of that has its place within secular society as we as equal in every way, people equal in authority like no one in the United States technically has inherently any more authority than anyone else. In the kingdom of God, God literally gives keys to certain people. God does. And they have authorization and certain stewardships. Like it's the church is way more. So like be, just be honest, dog. Are you just gun- like the United States government? So just be honest with me, dog. Are you just gunning for the red chair up there in Nevada? Like, are you just trying to become like a local, you know, area authority or general authority by like just totally oh, being gosh. a little like Motab? That, that no, I'm just like- <laughs> better, like, then you know that someone has made a grave mistake. The church is off the rails. <laughs> Oh, I'm totally going to have to edit that the one out. You know? <laughs> do not trust the institution when I rise high in the institution. Yeah. Are, are you just, are, are you just be honest. Are you gunning for one of those seats? You're hoping they call you to be like Reno, Nevada area authority. Cause you want people yeah, to be right. kissing your ring. That's the you know? last thing I want. <laughs> I want to, I want to be in the nursery, man. I want some, I want crackers okay. and listen to, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam over and over again. Oh, dude, I could be a primary pianist if I were better at the piano forever. Like funnest calling freaking ever. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, Good okay, stuff. cool. So this has been rad. Where can people find you and uh, your heinous digital desnattery and <laughs> uh, divine d- d- Danitism online? Digitally divine Danitism. Best, best place to go. Just YouTube, thoughtful faith. That's uh then and you can pull up my channel there. That's that's a good one. Or go to thoughtful-faith.com. It's my website up at the top. You can see it has links to the YouTube channel, to the podcast. And I'm also saying I have a group on Facebook, um, Thoughtful Saints. Oh. So if you're a Facebook nerd like I am and you want to talk with me and with other people in our group, uh go ahead and you and join full the, boomer uh, join the group. On Facebook. Oh, you have a Facebook group and they write yeah. strongly worded letters to people that they have are disappointed in. <laughs> you know what I'm Thought, saying? Thoughtful Saints is what we is what that group's called. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thanks for coming on the show, my man. This is Midnight Mormons. See you guys in the next program. Hey guys, Cardinal is here. Thanks for watching the video. Now, before we go on to the next video, we gotta talk. 
We've got a ton of subscribers for which we are very grateful, but unfortunately I'm going over the analytics and less than 15% of you guys have clicked on the bell icon next to the subscribe button. Now, besides being subscribed to this channel, you need to click that bell icon so you get alerted to every video we drop. We're making about three videos a week, dropping them once every other day, and you're not going to see all of them unless you've clicked on that bell icon. So please make sure you like and you share and you subscribe and you also click on the bell icon. See you guys in the next program.